All right, we have a recording started. We're going to continue in chapter 11. Uh, a few points just to make clear. The next assignment is, has been posted, which is assignment eight, I believe, which is on this unit on phase equilibria. So that's due the regular time next week. So please get a start on that. Um, somebody reminded me, I think it was Samantha, that I forgot to post the oral grades after I said I was going to do that last time. Um, I apologize, I'll do that this morning. I um, can say that everybody got over 80, which was great, because 80 was the grade that if you got below, you were able to repeat. So that was nice to see. So everyone did well. So no one, no one has to be worried or concerned about that. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say. Any questions, pop them in the chat. But for now, let's just push forward. Uh, we spent this chapter so far talking about different phase equilibria. Uh, we spent the, the very last unit we looked at was solubility. And so we're, what we're going to do is jump into a different type of solubility, which involves gases dissolving in liquids. So we're looking at solutions where the liquid is the solvent and the gas is potentially dissolved in the, 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 the solution. And we know that whenever you dissolve a gas into a liquid, what happens is you have a very strong um negative entropy entropy change because if you think about it if you take something like oxygen gas plus water and you're creating basically plus water uh what you're doing is you are losing a molecule of gas delta n of the gas is negative one so that means is the entropy change is going to be negative here. So entropy is working against you when you try to dissolve a gas into a liquid. Uh, the other thing we know is the entropy component of the whether something is spontaneous or not becomes increasingly important the higher the temperature. So generally what we find as well is that the solubility of gases in a liquid decreases when you increase the temperature. So gases generally don't dissolve very well in liquids, nowhere near as well as, as salts or other small molecules. So the solubility of oxygen in water is only around 10 to the minus three molar, uh, moles per liter will dissolve, so that's saturated uh, oxygen in water, whereas sodium chloride uh, is 5.4, you know, so that's 5,000 or 6,000 times uh, higher solubility than a gas like oxygen, a normal gas. Now, oxygen is not a very polar gas. Um, and sometimes we see gases that are much higher solubility in water if there's some other chemical reaction to make them more soluble. So for example, HCl gas is highly soluble in water because once you dissolve it, it dissociates not into sort of a dissolved gas, but instead dissociated ions in solution. So you can get very high concentrations of HCl in water uh, because of this dissociation reaction. Um, CO2 is another example where you can dissolve actually much more CO2 in water than you might otherwise expect for a gas because what CO2 can do is react with water to make carbonic acid. And carbonic acid uh, can also dissociate to make H plus plus HCO3 minus AQ. And this is actually a very, very important reaction for us because this, allow, because this allows much higher solubility of CO2 in water. Uh, what that means is that you can dissolve a lot of carbon dioxide in water, which is important to actually combat the global warming. Because the amount of CO2 we are putting in our air is obviously contributing to climate change um, but the oceans can soak up a lot of that CO2. So actually the effects we've experienced so far with respect to our, uh, you know, all the CO2 we're putting into the environment, that is far less severe than it would be if CO2 didn't do this reaction and then dissolve in water. It turns out that this is going to be or, or appears to be quite bad for the ocean itself because it generates H plus ions in the ocean water. So it contributes to a problem called ocean acidification. For the pH of the ocean water, 
especially near the surface, is going down. Since most life in the ocean is near the surface, uh, that's affecting organisms like coral. So that's not good. There is a quantitative relationship between the amount of gas that will dissolve into a sample of water and the pressure, partial pressure of that gas over the water, a relationship that we know is called Henry's Law. And so this just means the solubility of a gas in some solvent uh, is equal to a constant, K, which we call the Henry's Law constant, multiplied by the pressure of the gas. So you double the pressure, you double the solubility. Generally speaking, you increase the pressure of a gas, you're going to have a higher concentration of that gas in the water that it's in equilibrium with. So this is how uh, you, we can get so much CO2 into liquids that are under pressure, like champagne here, or like pop or beer or anything like that that is carbonated. Uh, and then once you release the pressure by opening the bottle or can, what happens is it starts to bubble because all of a sudden this pressure gets low. That means the solubility drops as well. And when the solubility drops, it comes out of solution in the form of bubbles. So that's what's going on when you have a fizzing, bubbling drink like that. It's all due to Henry's Law. Uh, another actually really... A notorious example of, I don't know if I call this the application, but uh, Henry's Law is a lake in West Africa called Lake Nios. And what was going on when the, with this lake is at the bottom of the lake, there was kind of cracks to um, volcanic sources that were causing CO2 to bubble upwards into the bottom of the lake. And as soon as the CO2 reached the bottom of the lake, the bottom was under very high pressure. So what that meant, because it was at the bottom of the lake, it was deep. And so the CO2 was a very, very high concentration at the bottom where it was first formed, and then lower concentrations towards the top. Um, what happened is there was something that happened in this lake called an inversion, and they don't know exactly how it happened. But essentially what happened is this high concentration CO2 water that was at the bottom of the lake somehow came up to the surface. And there's different theories on why that happened. They thought maybe it was rain and cold rainwater pushed down and put the water at the bottom of the lake upwards. Uh, who knows, maybe it was a um, small earthquake. Whatever happened, uh, the water was allowed to mix. And when the water that had a lot of CO2 at the bottom rose to the top, all of a sudden the pressure dropped and then the CO2 was not nearly as soluble anymore. So it started to bubble out of the solution. And then once it started bubbling, essentially this whole lake looked like it was boiling because all the CO2 was very, very rapidly coming out as the water mixed and the high CO2 concentration water from the bottom came up to the top. It created a giant carbon dioxide cloud that was heavier than the air and kind of spilled out over the top of the volcano and then went downwards uh, to the village below. It killed 1,746 people. Uh, and basically what happened is just all the air that they were breathing got replaced by this giant cloud of CO2 and they all skated to death. Uh, so yeah, they don't know exactly what caused it, but what they do today to prevent that from happening again is they have this little like bubbler essentially is they pump air or suck water from the bottom and shoot it up. And so it's that that's doing is preventing this buildup and then this sudden eruption. Instead, there's sort of this constant slow uh, emission of CO2 from this. So here's just a, uh, um, a graph which is showing the solubility of different substances as it pertains to temperature. One thing I always find interesting about this particular plot is the curve for NaCl, like this, very horizontal. What that means is the solubility of salt in water essentially is temperature independent. That hot water and cold water more or less have the same ability to dissolve NaCl. But other than that one, almost every solid has an upwards curve, meaning if you increase the temperature, you increase the solubility. So most things become more soluble in water as you increase the temperature if they were solids. The ones that are here that are all negative, 
are all gases. HCl is a gas at room temperature. Ammonia is a gas at room temperature. SO2 is a gas at room temperature. All the gases, you can see their solubility drops as temperature increases. This makes sense with what we've been seeing so far because of the entropy involved, entropy change. Taking something like uh, potassium nitrate, the delta S for dissolving that is actually positive. Right, because you're going from a, a pure crystalline material to dissolved ions in solution. You have more particles being formed. Um, and so we know dissolving a pure salt, like any of these things, has a positive delta S. But dissolving a gas in a liquid has a negative delta S, which is why you see the different temperature, um, temperature dependence. It's funny with sodium chloride, because sodium chloride you'd think would have a positive delta S as well. Uh, sometimes delta S can be difficult to predict. And, you know, we have some sort of simple rules that we went through in the previous chapter to predict what it is. But sometimes you get a, an interesting situation where it might be obvious that if you take NaCl solid and you dissolve it into ions, that now you have more ions, so therefore delta S must be positive. But sometimes what happens is uh, water molecules will structure themselves Cells around those ions to, to hydrate them, solvate them, and that can effectively actually um, uh, reduce the number of microstates. So you can have delta S values that are not as positive as you might think or very close to zero. Let's look at an example with Henry's Law. It says the partial pressure inside a can of Pepsi is around four, well, in this example, it's four atmospheres, so 25. What's the solubility of CO2? The Henry's law constant for CO2 is 3.3 times 10 to the minus 2 moles per liter atmospheres. So it's just S is equal to the Henry's law constant, KH, I guess we'll call that, um, times the pressure. So the solubility for CO2 is going to be K value, 3.3 times 10 to the minus 2 mole per liter atmosphere times four atmospheres atmospheres cancel this is going to give us our answer in units of moles per liter and what does that equal 6.6 13.2 and, and that's the same thing as 1.32 times 10 to the minus one uh now this is kind of a weird example because we only have technically one sig fig. So I guess what we could say is that our answer is just 0 0.1 mole per liter. So we don't have a lot of um, a lot of accuracy, I guess, with that number. Not accuracy, like we don't have a lot of uh, uh, we pretty wide error bars, I guess we could say on it. Colligative properties are what we're going to be moving into next. And colligative properties are ones that they're a property of a solution that depend on the number of dissolved particles in solution, but not on what those particles are. It doesn't matter what type of the particle we have, it just matters how many are present. Uh, and there's a number of different colligative properties that we're going to be looking at. There's one called vapor pressure lowering, boiling point elevation, freezing point depression, and osmotic pressure. So these are all properties of a solution that depend, yeah, only on the number of particles that can be present in there. First, we want to just define something that we call the Van Hoff factor. Uh, so the Van Hoff factor, what this is, is a factor that you would multiply the concentration of something by uh, to give you the total number of particles. So, for example, if you have something like sodium chloride solid, and let's say we had a solution that was 0 0.5 molar NaCl solid, once you dissolve that in water and it dissociates into particles, Na plus plus Cl minus, you actually get two moles of particles for every mole of NaCl you dissolve. So, what this means is that after this dissolves, you would have 1.0 molar of just particles. where 0 0.5 molar would be the sodium plus and the other 0 0.5 molar would be the chloride minus. So we would say that the factor we had to multiply the NaCl by is two. We might say I equals two. 
for NaCl because it dissociates into two particles. So we can do this for pretty well anything, right? If you have uh, Na2SO4, sodium sulfate, this dissociates into 2Na plus plus SO4 2 minus. So I in this case would be equal to 3 because each mole of Na2SO4 uh, dissociates into 3 particles total. So I is just this factor we multiply our concentration by to account for the fact that the substance will dissociate into multiple particles. If you have something that we call a non-electrolyte, something that does not associate at all, an example might be sucrose. We would say I is just equal to one because you get one particle for every molecule that you begin with. Uh, you could also have I values that are fractional, that are not whole numbers, because if you take something like HF, this will partially dissociate into HF plus F minus. So I, in this case, could be somewhere between 1 and 2. I don't know. Let's call it 1.1. 1 .1. Right? So you can have I values that aren't necessarily whole numbers either. So let's just quickly run through a number of these and figure out um, what the Van Hoff factor should be. NaOH becomes Na plus and OH minus, so I equals 2. NaHSO4 becomes Na plus plus HSO4 minus the bisulfate anion. Again, I is 2. CaCl2 will dissolve the Ca2 plus plus 2Cl minus, so I is 3. Aluminum tribromide. Uh, K2SO4, I equals 3. And glucose, I equals 1. So just make sure that you can look at a particular substance like any of the ones in this list um, and hopefully see kind of immediately how many particles it could dissociate into two and whatever that number is, is going to be your Van Hoff factor I. Great. So vapor pressure, uh, remember vapor pressure, we talked, we've talked about this quite a bit actually, it's when you have a liquid in equilibrium with uh, the vapor phase, as you might have in a closed container where you have a liquid and you have this equilibrium between the gas and the liquid particles. Um, we would say that when it reaches equilibrium, there will be some pressure, which we call the vapor pressure of that liquid. The vapor pressure of the liquid is, you know, the constant, assuming you have a pure liquid in there at a given temperature. Uh, and it's a function of the intermolecular forces present meaning that strong intermolecular forces will give you a lower vapor pressure because strong intermolecular forces want to hold the molecules into the liquid phase more. Um, and we also know lower temperatures will have lower vapor pressures as well because uh, if you increase the temperature, there's more molecules in the liquid phase that can evaporate, that have enough energy to evaporate. And so you end up with a higher proportion of the molecules in the gas phase. So we already looked at these factors before for vapor pressure. But now what we're going to do is look at vapor pressure, not on pure liquids, but on solutions. So if there's something dissolved in the material. And that's this third factor we're going to be looking at, the presence of a solute, like a solid or a liquid, and how that can affect the vapor pressure. And we have a law to actually describe this called Raoult's law. And it says the, the presence of a solute will reduce the vapor pressure of the solvent over the solution. Basically what that means then, if you dissolve something into this beaker and make a solution out of it, the vapor pressure above it will drop. Okay, And it'll drop in proportion to how concentrated that solute is in your solution. Um, so I guess there's two variations here. You could have a volatile solute or a non-volatile solute. So a volatile solute is just one that also has its own vapor pressure. Like if you had a solution of ethanol in water, ethanol we might consider to be a solute that is volatile. 
a non-volatile solvent doesn't have vapor pressure uh, or any appreciable vapor pressure. An example here might be sodium chloride. Make a solution of sodium chloride in water, it is not going to um, have a vapor pressure associated with it. Okay, so if you have the pure solvent at a given temperature, it's going to have its own vapor pressure. And we had this little zero here, meaning it's, it's uh, I guess, under standard conditions, which means it's pure. The activity of that material is one. And we know for pure liquids, activity is defined as one. So the pure liquid is the standard state in this, con this particular situation. The actual pressure in the solution is going to be equal to the P0 of the solvent, okay? Uh, actually, the P... I'm going to get rid of that for a second. The actual pressure of the solvent, or the, the vapor pressure above the solvent, is equal to the vapor pressure of the pure solvent multiplied by the mole fraction of the solvent. So if you dissolve something into that solution, the mole fraction of the solvent becomes less than one all of a sudden. Mole fraction is one when you have only a pure solution, pure, pure solvent. So the mole fraction of the solvent is the number of mole solvent that we have divided by total number of moles present. So we have the moles of the solvent plus the moles of the solute multiplied by I for that. So we're counting up moles of particles really here. So we need the moles of solvent particles and then the moles of solvent particles plus particles of solute. That gives us mole fraction. We multiply that by the vapor pressure of the pure solvent and that will give us the actual vapor pressure for that solvent. It's fair enough. If you have a solute that is also volatile, you could say the exact same thing about that one. So if this is an example of a molecule of water and ethanol, both of which are volatile, this will have a P0, let's call it A, and this will have a P0, let's call it B. What we can say is that the P of the solvent is equal to the mole fraction of the solvent times the P0 of the solvent. So this one would be A. Also, the solute is going to have its own vapor pressure, which is equal to its mole fraction times its uh, vapor pressure when it's pure. This would be, in this example, B. And then the total pressure above the solution is going to be the pressure of the solute plus the solvent, which we could say is mole fraction times vapor pressure of pure solute plus mole fraction solvent times vapor pressure, pure solvent. This is a lot of uh, lot going on here, but hopefully this isn't too confusing. Notice in the equations we have down here for mole fractions, we didn't include I. I guess maybe we could. It's just that when you have a, a solute that has its own vapor pressure, generally speaking, they don't dissociate. Uh, so I is almost always one in these examples because if it's dissociated, it's not going to have much of a vapor pressure, right? The only thing that really dissociates are ionic compounds, and ionic compounds have no appreciable vapor pressure. So put the I in, just realize the I is almost always going to be equal to one. Okay, so this is just a, a picture kind of showing the same thing. If you have a situation where you have hexane and heptane, which are both volatile liquids mixed in each other, you can go from anywhere from pure heptane to pure hexane. If you increase the mole fraction of heptane, it goes from a vapor pressure of zero up to a vapor pressure of whatever that value is, eight or something. Uh, hexane, if you go from pure hexane, which gives you a high vapor pressure, as you make sure vapor pressure of hexane goes down, if you add the two pressures together, this would be P total and um, of course, at either extreme, the pressure total is just the pressure of either pure hexane or the pure heptane. Great. So really all Raoult's law says is that if you dilute some solvent, its vapor pressure will go down with its concentration or with its mole fraction. Um, 
Raoult's law, by the way, is kind of, uh, maybe I guess we'll put it this way. It works if the solutions behave ideally. So if you remember back when you did the gas laws, you know, PV equals NRT, we would have talked a lot at that point in time about the ideal gas equation, what an ideal gas is, and we make a bunch of assumptions about ideal gases regarding their pressure and strength of intermolecular forces. In the real world, no gas is perfectly ideal. Some are very close to ideal, and the ideal gas equation works very well. But then in other cases, you know, the, the, the law really breaks down. Same is true with Raoult's law. Raoult's law also breaks down if you have a solution that does not behave ideally. And so what ideal solutions are, are ones where the intermolecular forces of the two components that are mixed together uh, are very, very similar. So the molecules have to be similar in size, similar in shape, and similar in strength and type of intermolecular forces. So something that might be really good, for example, might be here benzene and methyl benzene, or maybe like we had in the previous example, if you have uh, hexane and heptane. Heptane's a little longer, a little bit bigger, but they have, they're both very nonpolar. They're both sort of long chains, uh, similar in size, only one carbon different. So if you think of something like water and like KCl, these ones are actually quite different from each other. Um, one's an ionic compound and it breaks up into ions. It has charges, it has ion dipole intermolecular forces, where water just has hydrogen bonding, um, quite different, you know, it doesn't ionize to any significant extent. Yeah, water auto ionizes a little bit, but like super low concentrations of 10 to the minus seven of each of the uh, ions it makes. So for this reason, a solution of KCl in water is probably further from being ideal than a solution of hexane and heptane. So in a real situation, what happens is Raoult's law doesn't actually perfectly predict the vapor pressures that you would actually see in solution. There are more complicated equations that can give you a better idea, uh, which I kind of think are a bit beyond the scope of what we're doing here because um, we're looking for sort of general trends. Uh, so we're going to be using uh, Raoult's law for all sorts of different solutions like this anyway, even though you have to realize that in the real world, um, if dealing with non-ideal solutions, the real true answer, correct answer, if you were to do this experimentally in person, might be a little bit different from what we would predict on paper. That's the nice thing about chemistry is, you know, as a subject, it's, it's still very strongly experimentally based. We have to do the experiment. And growing in chemistry is, is a branch called computational chemistry, where we use quantum mechanical uh, equations and fast computers to run calculations for us to, to predict chemical properties. But at the end of the day, the results you get from any of those simulations or uh, calculations are always going to be inferior to what you learn from experiment. It's kind of like, it makes me think sometimes of when you see like NASA send a spacecraft up, you know, a rocket into space and, it, you know, the some piece falls off and then it goes into the next stage and all these different parts of a, of a space launch. And you think like, well, didn't they just, didn't they calculate all that stuff? Like, shouldn't it just work automatically? Why is everyone so like surprised and happy and cheering every time it's a successful stage? That's just an example of where, yeah, you can calculate all you want, but it's really easy to overlook some small factor that all of a sudden causes what you thought was going to work to not work at all. Which is great because as chemists, we're never going to be put out of work, right? We're never going to be replaced by uh, um, uh, computers or AI that can do work for us. Raoult's law, the saturated vapor pressures at 298K for benzene and methyl benzene, which would probably make an ideal solution, are 12.85 uh, kilopascals and 3.85 kilopascals. So let's write down what we know so far. We're going to say the P0 for the benzene, we'll call that B, is 12.85 kilopascals. 
and the P0 for methyl benzene, let's call that MB, 3.85 kilopascals, respectively. What is the total vapor pressure over a solution containing 2.0 moles of benzene and 3.0 moles of methyl benzene? Okay, so you mix these two together. Um, something you may learn in thermo in the future is that when you mix two liquids together, the total volume you get actually isn't usually the same as the uh, sum of the two volumes you get. But in this case, it doesn't matter. If you mix two moles of benzene and three moles of methyl benzene, you're going to get five moles total of particles. We could say that the X of the benzene is the moles of benzene over moles of benzene plus moles of methyl benzene. 2.00 mole divided by 2.00 mole plus 3.00 mole equals 0 0.400. And that is unitless. Moles cancel moles. Mole fraction is always a unitless measure. If that's the mole fraction of benzene, the mole fraction of methyl benzene is 1 minus that. So it's 0.6. You could also calculate the same way we did above and put 3 divided by 5 is 0.6. Uh, either way, works. So we would say the pressure total is P0x, x, sorry, B, B plus X methyl benzene, P0 methyl benzene equals 0 0.400, 12.85 kilopascals plus 0.6 times 3.85 kilopascals. And let me find out my slide where I have the number because I don't want to calculate this all over again. Uh, the answer is 7.45 kilopascals. Perfect. We're doing great. All right, got about 15 minutes left. Um, some homework questions, basically the same types of questions. Give them a try. There are some questions about this as well on the next assignment, so you can get some practice doing those. The second colligative property we're going to be looking at after um, vapor pressure lowering is one called boiling point elevation. And the idea here is if, that if you dissolve something in water, you cause its boiling point to increase. And the um, increase in boiling temperature or increase in boiling point is in going to be equal to a constant KB, which we call the molal boiling point elevation constant, which is an, a boring name that used to have a cooler name. It used to be called the ebulioscopic constant, but they changed that. Who's they? I don't know. Uh, IUPAC, I guess. Molal boiling point ele elevation constant and it's a constant associated with the solvent, not the solute. Doesn't matter what the solute is because this is a colligative property. You multiply that by the molality of the solution, meaning the molality of any dissolved particles, multiplied by the Van Hoff factor for those particles themselves. So basically what this means is if you're boiling water, and you dissolve anything in the water, that's going to increase the boiling temperature of that solution. Um, I think this is assuming that the solute is something that is itself non-volatile. So if you're cooking your pasta and you throw some salt in, that will increase the boiling point of the water, but actually it increases it by a, an extremely small amount. Uh, some people say that, you know, you add salt to water when you're cooking pasta to increase the temperature and cook it faster. That's not true. Um, it, the, like a pinch of salt will have essentially no effect on the boiling point of water. If you put a, like a cup of salt in like a big pot of water, put a lot of salt in there, uh, you might be able to increase the boiling point in a degree or two, but you're not going to have this huge change in 
boiling point, like 10 degrees or 20 degrees. So does salt help water boil faster? Well, it doesn't boil faster. The idea is boil hotter. And yes, it does boil a little bit hotter, but uh, only a very like fraction of a degree if you put a reasonable amount in. So why do we add salt to water when we boil pasta? It's to make the pasta saltier, taste better. Purely a salt thing. Um, another thing is if you are starting with sugar water and you want to make, uh, well, let's say you, you're, you're making maple syrup. What the, the way they actually tell when maple syrup is ready is they use a thermometer and they use, sometimes it's called a candy thermometer. And what they do is they stick it in the, uh, the maple syrup, they boil it and they boil it, which drives off the water, right? Evaporates away the water. And as a result, what happens is the molality of sugar in the remaining water in here goes up. And as that molality gets higher and higher, the boiling temperature goes higher and higher as well. So they watch the temperature on the thermometer as it creeps up as the water boils away and then they know that the once it reaches a certain boiling temperature that it's ready to go and what you do if you go past that boiling temperature to a new higher boiling temperature you could maybe instead of making maple syrup get to a point where you could make maple sugar right and so candy they do the same thing they make solutions of water and sugar and boil it and heat it get to specific temperatures and the specific temperatures um that you get to allow you to tell what point it is in the candy making process. So maple syrup is about seven degrees above the boiling point of water. If you ever want to make maple syrup, that's a way to do it. Get, a, get yourself a candy thermometer. Um, another one that's actually extremely similar to boiling point elevation is freezing point depression, where the freezing temperature or the melting point, I guess, of a liquid will decrease when you dissolve something in that liquid. Um, so the, the equation for that, the, the calculated change in freezing temperature is again, uh, this constant, which is associated with the solvent and not the solute, is the molal freezing point depression constant. I said the boiling point one used to be called the ebulioscopic constant. What did the freezing point one be called? Um, I can't remember. It had a similar type of name though, but anyway, you don't have to know it. That's multiplied by the Van Hoff factor I times the molality of the solution. This is of course how we, why we salt our roads in the winter. Um, by putting salt on the roads, what that does is it creates a salt solution and, and uh, that solution of salt water that you would create has a much lower freezing temperature than pure water because it now has a dissolved solid in it. I believe the freezing temperature of saturated salt water is around minus 12 degrees Celsius. So salt as a method to remove ice and snow from the roads stops working if you go to temperatures below about minus 12. You could use other salts like calcium chloride would be more effective than sodium chloride because it has a Van Hoff factor of three where NaCl has a Van Hoff factor of two. So because that is a factor in um, vapor pressure, or sorry, uh, freezing temperature lowering, calcium chloride for a given number of moles would be more effective than sodium chloride. Or sodium chloride is a lot cheaper. So that's why we use it. But yeah, hypothetically, you could be using other materials that would be more effective on a per mole basis. Um, so all kinds of applications of this, you can actually create ice cream by taking a salt and ice mixture and putting, uh, that, that creates a cold mixture that'll go down to about minus 10, minus 12. And then you can put uh, a bucket inside with your ice cream and stir, and that will freeze it eventually. Animals like frogs and fish actually create, um, in their blood, they call them, uh, what they basically do is they create molecules in their blood to increase the molality of 
dissolve particles. And what that does is it lowers the freezing temperature of their blood so that if uh, ice crystals don't form in their blood, if the temperature gets very cold. This is important for cold blooded creatures like amphibians and fish. Uh, um, antifreeze as well, we put a liquid, it's not just pure water, because pure water would freeze in there. So we put typically uh, something like ethylene glycol. Make solutions of water and depending on the concentration of those solutions, you will have, you know, sometimes you can see antifreeze that's like minus 20 or minus 40, depends on the concentration of dissolved materials in it. So yeah, all those are different applications of freezing point depression. Let's look at an example. You add 1.5 kilograms of ethylene glycol antifreeze to 4,550 grams of water in your car's radiator. Uh, what are the boiling point and freezing points of the solution? So we know because we're making a solution, the boiling point is going to go up and the freezing point is also going to go down. So both kind of happen at once here. I'm sure I got my numbers in front of me. Okay, so I guess the first thing we want to figure out is I. And because ethylene glycol is an organic compound and is not a salt, it's not an ionic compound, I is just going to be equal to one. So it's not really going to have it play any role in this particular one. What we need to do is figure out the, oh no, where did my screen go? Come back. There we go. We need to figure out the molality of the solution, the molality of the ethylene glycol. So the molality of the ethylene glycol, I guess, e.g., it's going to equal to the moles of ethylene glycol over the kilograms of the solvent, which is water. Um, the moles is going to equal the mass over the molar mass. Uh, so we're given the mass of ethylene glycol as 1.50 kilograms. Let's make that 1,500 grams. We need to divide that by the molar mass of ethylene glycol, which is 62.07 grams per mole. And that needs to be multiplied by the number of kilograms of the solvent, which is 4.550 kg. And when you calculate this out, you get 5.311 molal. Molal is like a lowercase m, italicized is sort of the units. And it's, it'd be in units of moles per kilogram. So our change in boiling point It's going to be I times KB times molality, which is equal to one times KB for water, 0 0.512 degrees C per molal, multiplied by 5.311 molal. This is cancel, and you're going to get. 2.72 degrees Celsius. So adding all of that solute, right? One and a half kilos to four and a half. So like this makes it like 25% of ethylene glycol only raises the boiling point by less than three degrees Celsius. So our new boiling point is going to be the original boiling point, which is 100 degrees Celsius, plus the delta TB. 100, 102.72 uh, degrees Celsius. We do the exact same thing basically for freezing point depression. I times KF times molality equals again one times our KF for water is 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal times 5.311 molal and that gives us a value of negative 
9.88 degrees Celsius. So our new freezing temperature is going to be zero degrees Celsius minus, uh, I guess that's a positive value here, minus our delta TF. So the new freezing temperature of this material is going to be negative 9.88 degrees Celsius. So yeah, I guess, you know, you've de depressed the freezing point by about 10 degrees Celsius, but I still wouldn't want that particular mixture sitting in my uh, car in a normal winter day around here, because that'll still freeze. It'll pretty easily hit minus 10. Okay, we have one colligative property left to go. And just seeing where I am in my slideshow, there's still about 12 slides left to go. So I am not going to continue right now because we're out of time. So thank you to the three people that are here in person. And of course, to all the people online who are going to be watching this uh, with uh, all kinds of joy in the future. If you have any questions, let me know, send me an email. I will be also, of course, posting the oral exam grades very shortly. And have a great weekend, everyone. See ya.